Prophets and Prophets. And they're both spelled P-R-O-P-H-E-T. Two kinds of prophets, although the word prophet, P-R-O-F-I-T, may enter into this to some extent. This is another sermon. I've only preached a few as to why God's ministers should not set dates, times, and places for happenings. In other words, stay away from these kind of predictions. Uh, as most of you know, I do stay away from those things. However, a lot of other people do not. And we find that mankind seems susceptible to men who come along and prophesy of events, whether they're inside the church or outside of the church. And we're going to read, first of all, in Deuteronomy 18, about prophets, both about the source of their income, or P-R-O-F-I-T-S, and the source of their prophecies. Deuteronomy 18. The priests, the Levites, and all the tribe of Levi shall have no part nor inheritance with Israel. They shall eat the offerings of the Lord made by fire and his inheritance. Therefore shall they have no inheritance among their brethren. The Lord is their inheritance as he hath said unto them. And you'll recall that when God divided up the land of old Canaan to the Israelites, the tribe of Levi was specifically included from a land inheritance. They were to own no property in the land of Israel. Their inheritance was God. And, of course, he goes on and then explains how they did live. And this shall be the priest's due, D-U-E, from the people, from them that offer a sacrifice, whether it be ox or sheep, and they shall give unto the priest the shoulder and the two cheeks and the maw, and the first fruit also of thy corn and thy wine, and of thine oil, and the first of the fleece of thy sheep shall thou give them. For the Lord thy God hath chosen him out of all thy tribes to stand to minister in the name of the Lord, him and his sons forever. So their living was to come from the tithe of the people. The Levites, the entire tribe of Levi, Levi who served as the ministers of God, were to get their living and all their expenses from the tithe, or the 10% from the people, and they were to minister in the name of God or in the name of the Lord. Verse 6, And if a Levite come from any of thy gates out of all Israel, where he sojourned, and come with all the desire of his mind into the place where the Lord, unto the place which the Lord shall choose, then he shall minister in the name of the Lord his God, as all his brethren the Levites do, which stand there before the Lord. They shall have like portions to eat beside that which cometh of the sale of his patrimony. So the ministers who were in one place or who stayed in one place were treated the same way as, for instance, the traveling evangelist or the minister who went to a new community to start a new church or a new group or minister somewhere else. They were all to get their living from the tithe, and of course they were to do all of this in the name of God. Then there is a warning to the people inserted right in the middle of this instruction about the ministers or the Levites. When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you any one that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that uses divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of those abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. So he tells them not to do this list of things. And then he says, this is what the Canaanites did. And in fact, this is why I'm driving them out of the land, because of what they did. He lists all of these things which have to do with, with wizardry and prophecy and so on. I'm going to read a couple other verses. Turn to Leviticus 19 and verse 26. On the observer of times, he's giving the law to Israel, including, Ye shall not eat anything with the blood, neither shall ye use enchantment, nor observe times. And King Manasseh, if you recall, is one of the most wicked kings in ancient Israel. Second Chronicles chapter 33 2 Chronicles 33, Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 50 and 5 years in Jerusalem, but did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, like unto the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. 
For he built again the high places which Hezekiah his father had broken down, and he reared up altars for Balaam, and made groves, and worshipped all the host of heaven, and served them. Also he built altars in the house of the Lord, whereof the Lord had said, In Jerusalem shall my name be forever. And he built altars for all the host of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. And he caused his children to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Hinnom. Also he observed times, and used enchantments, and used witchcraft, and dealt with a familiar spirit, and with wizards. He wrought much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. And as you read of his reign over Israel, these false religious practices which he observed, including the observation of times and so on, caused God's judgment to fall upon the whole nation. Now this necromancy or necromancy is given in the dictionary as N-I-G-R-O-M-A-N-C, and it's from necros, the word for in Latin for dead body. And it indicates that it was part of the so-called witchcraft where they talked to persons who were dead in order to foretell the future. So every one of these things listed here in Deuteronomy 18 has to do some way or other with foretelling events that are to come, whether it's divination, observer of times, enchanter, witchcraft, consulting with familiar spirits, wizardry, or whatever. In each case, these are different ways or different methods that supposedly they were to they were to tell events that were to come to pass sometime in the future. So every one of the abominations listed in here that the ministers, the Levites, were told not to get involved with had to do with either attempting to foretell the future by some means or attempting to convince someone that you could foretell the future by some means, whether true or false. Now, telling the future or foretelling the future as far as Christians are concerned, falls into two categories. The foretelling of future events that would affect persons or nations according to God's word, or foretelling those same future events through some other source, something other than God's word. And let's read on in Deuteronomy 18, and then we'll get into those two divisions a little more later. Deuteronomy 18, verse 13 still speaking to the Israelites and to the Levites. Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. The margin of the most Bibles will tell you that probably should have been translated upright or sincere. We know from the other scripture that man in no case can be perfect, but he can be sincere. sincere. And God insists that man be sincere in his relationship with God. For these nations which thou shalt possess, hearken unto observers of times, and unto diviners. But as for thee, the Lord thy God hath not suffered thee so to do. The Canaanite people were fortune tellers, followed witches, and prophesied and predicted the future, and so on. Then he says this, The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me. Now Moses is speaking. Unto him shall ye hearken. According to all that thou desiredest of the Lord thy God in Horeb in the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, neither let me see this great fire any more, that I die not. And if you recall, at the mount, God spoke the words of the Ten Commandments in an audible voice. And it so frightened and terrified the people that they pleaded with Moses, Moses, you talk to God, and then you tell us what God said because we can't stand God's voice anymore. We can't hear his voice and live. And verse 17, And the Lord said unto me, They have well spoken that which they have spoken. God told Moses this was correct for Israel to say this, that Israel would then no longer again hear the direct voice of God, but would hear God's voice through men, through prophets. So this is correct, that men speak God's word to the people, ever since the uh, incident at the mount where God spoke the words of the Ten Commandments. He goes on, I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee, like unto Moses, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. Now we know from the New Testament that the prophet, like unto Moses, was Jesus Christ. 
And Jesus Christ is called a prophet many places in the New Testament. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. But the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. God Almighty takes prophecy so seriously that he says that a man who speaks claims to speak in the name of God, but God has not spoken to him, that man is to be executed. That's how serious God is about prophecy, and we'll see this a little more as we get into some of the other prophets and some of the rest of God's word. He said, The prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, claiming he got his source of prophecy, predictions, future events, or whatever, from another god, both of them. The prophet who claims to speak from God falsely, and the one who claims to speak from another god shall die. And uh, you wonder, well, how do we know when the man is speaking falsely? Here's the way. And if thou say in thine heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? How will we know the man has spoken falsely, claiming he's speaking God's prophecy? Verse 22 of Deuteronomy 18. Write this down on the side of your Bible or someplace. And when some of these people come to you with prophecies that they claim they get in visions or dreams or words from God, you remember Deuteronomy 18, verse 22, if you forget all the rest that I speak this morning. When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken. But the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously, thou shalt not be afraid of him, or the Hebrew word could have said, thou shalt not honor him, nor be in awe of him. So some will say, well, this man has prophesied certain things, and uh, uh, some of the things came to pass, and some of the things did not. Like the uh, man who does the nightclub show here in Phoenix some years ago did a series of, I think, 20 prophecies at the end of the year for events of the coming year. And I saved the newspaper article, and out of the 20, one thing came to pass. He said there would be more inflation. Every other event he predicted did not come to pass. So what was he by an overwhelming vote of 19 to 1? He was a false prophet. Now, he didn't claim to speak in the name of God because he was a nightclub entertainer, but he spoke in the name of some authority. Others, of course, speak in the name of God and claim that they have dreams or visions or God speaks to them or whatever and tells them that certain things will come to pass. You really have no other way of knowing whether God told him that or not until it does not come to pass. How do you defy a person who comes along and says, well, God told me that on such and such a date, such and such is going to happen? You do not really know whether God spoke to him or not. So you have to wait out the event. God tells you the one way. When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, saying, you know, in other words, speaking says, God told me this, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken, but the prophet has spoken it presumptuously, thou shalt not hold him in awe, thou shalt not pay him homage or honor. Now, apparently, since the dawn of creation, and we can get this from the Bible, we know this from current history and past history, mankind, almost all of mankind, has had a desire to know the future. That's how the witch doctors in Africa hold control over the superstitious people there by claiming they either can predict and or control the future. There is one thing that man is always afraid of when he does not believe in the one, in the one true God of the Christian Bible, and that is the future. The future is that great unknown thing that he has to pass through, and unless he has the simple truth of God and believes in God, he has a fear of it. Christians should never fear the future because we know that God Almighty absolutely, 
totally controls it, and he's told us he's going to bring to pass a future that will redound to our good and our eternal life. If we believe that, how can we fear the future? And yet that fear of the future causes men to go to other men and listen to them say, well, such and so is going to come to pass, and this is going to come to pass, and that is going to come to pass, and they pay them homage. They stand in awe of them. They fear them. And among the Christians, it's especially true, they fear them and what they say if they say, God Almighty told me this, or Jesus told me this, or an angel told me this, or whatever. That is probably why predictions about Christ's return are the major theme of preaching in Christendom. Because Christians do look forward to the return of Christ. Most of them desire it, and they just love to hear someone come along with some sort of mathematics or some sort of computations or some sort of dream revision and say, oh, Jesus is returning next week or next month or next year or whatever. And what can we do? Well, about the only thing we can do is follow the instruction here in Deuteronomy 18. Wait until the next week comes or the next month or the next year or whatever. A preacher down in Tucson, if you recall, predicted the rapture as of some date in June, about a year ago or possibly two years ago. Gave the date, and it was in all the newspapers and so on. The date came and went, and he said he'd made a 40-day mistake. So that ended up in the newspaper, and the 40 days went by and still no rapture. Well, the cartoonist who draws the cartoons in the Arizona Republic just a few weeks after that had a picture of this man, a minister, being interviewed by television cameras at his pool out in the backyard of a house. And um, by the way, the minister had been interviewed and he had said, well, he was not surprised when it didn't happen because these things were in God's time and it would come to pass eventually anyway. So Benson drew this cartoon showing this man saying to the television interviewer, I was not surprised when the rapture didn't take place on June, whatever it was. And then up in the upper right-hand corner was a big voice coming from heaven and said, Me neither. <laughs> And I hope <coughs> and I hope a lot of Christians caught on by the truth of that. God is not surprised when men's prophecies do not come to pass. And it showed the foolishness of a man who would claim to be able to place a date, time, and place on a specific happening that God would bring to pass. The preaching of God's Outworking of his prophecies over centuries is generally not very popular. In fact, the um, preaching of men of centuries ago that Christ could not possibly come for hundreds of years did not make them famous. The men who become famous are the men who preach that Christ will return very soon, very quickly, and I mean they're, they're famous, yes, but only for a very short time until after the date, time, and place. One man here in, uh, not from Phoenix, but from California several years ago, quite a few years ago now, in the 60s, prophesied the collapse of uh, California into the Pacific Ocean. He not only made his living on that for about five or six years, but after the dates had been set a couple times and didn't happen, he moved to Phoenix and bought the Adams Hotel in downtown Phoenix for over a million dollars and admitted he paid for it with money given to him by the people who had followed him during this five or six years when he was predicting California falling into the sea. And God alone knows how many people in California quit their jobs, sold their homes, entirely disrupted their lives because of this man's prophecy which did not come to pass. With that minister in Tucson, Arizona, the newspaper reported that many people down there had sold their homes, their cars, quit their jobs, cashed in their life insurance policies, and given that minister all of that money in order to warn people of this impending rapture on June such and so of a couple years ago. So you see, this is no joke. This has destroyed, literally, the lives of many people. With the man in Phoenix who predicted California falling into the sea, he admitted, and they gave the name of an Iowa farmer who actually gave this false prophet his farm in Iowa. 
And the Iowa farmer ended up a pauper at the age of 50-some years of age and couldn't even provide a living for his family because he'd given his livelihood to this prophet who then bought a million dollars worth of property here in Phoenix and apparently has lived happily ever after. All right, turn to Isaiah. Before we consider this further, let's read some things that God says about himself and about prophecies to show you how serious this is. In Isaiah 41 through about 48, God is ridiculing false gods and, of course, warning Israel and ridiculing them of their following of these false gods. And he mentions prophecy or something about prophecy several times. Isaiah 41, verse 22, Let them bring forth and show us what shall happen. Let them show the former things, what they be, that we may consider them and know the latter end of them, or declare us things for to come. Show the things that are to come hereafter, that we may know that ye are gods. Yea, do good or do evil, that we may be dismayed and behold it together. You can see the sarcasm here that God has toward gods or people who follow gods that say they can foretell the future. Behold, ye are of nothing, and your work of naught, an abomination is he that chooseth you. Isaiah 42 Verse 8 and 9, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. Behold, the former things are come to pass, and new things do I declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. So God claims that he, God Almighty, does prophesy the future. Chapter 43, verses 6 through 9. I will say to the north, Give up, and to the south, Keep not back, Bring my sons from far, And my daughters from the ends of the earth, Even every one that is called by my name, For I have created him for my glory. I have formed him, yea, I have made him. Bring forth the blind people that have eyes, And the deaf that have ears. Let all the nations be gathered together, And let the people be assembled. Who among them can declare this, And show us former things? Let them bring forth their witnesses, that they may be justified, or let them hear, and say, It is truth. Then God says to Israel, Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. So in this long series of chapters, God is telling Israel through his most famous prophet, Isaiah, other than Jesus and Moses, that he, God Almighty, alone is God, there are no other gods, and that no one else can foretell the future. He ridicules them for it. In, verse, in chapter 44, beginning in verse 24, Thus saith the Lord thy Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb, I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself. In other words, I am the God who created everything, that frustrateth the tokens of the liars, and maketh diviners mad, that turneth wise men backward, and maketh their knowledge foolish, that confirmeth the word of his prophet, and performeth the counsel of his messengers. In other words, God says, I am the one who, when my prophets say something is going to come to pass, I cause it to come to pass. I confirm the word of my prophets. Now, about um, six months ago or so, not too awful long ago, some people out in uh, California apparently gave a prophecy on the date of the rapture. I did not see their prophecy on the date of the rapture, but someone sent me their newspaper advertisement, about that big in the newspaper, in which they apologize for their error in prophecy. I do not have a copy of the newspaper article, but in effect it said that we were mistaken in our mathematics in figuring out the Bible times, and so we made an error not being adept at handling God's prophecies. However, we do know the rapture is going to come to pass, and God will give us the correct days, and so on and so on. And they apologized for being wrong and said they'd be right the next time. Well, I wrote the man a letter, or the men, or whoever they are, and I'm going to read some of that letter 
because sometimes it's not just a case of the man being a prophet who made a mistake. Maybe there's something else involved. And uh, we also have this same situation with many other cases. The man of uh, California falling into the sea, if I recall, changed the dates about three times over a period of several years and simply kept on going. Some of his followers fell off and new ones came. I said to these people, you apologize for your error in falsely predicting certain future events. You try to indicate that that is no great fault in a prophet as long as the prophet admits his mistake later and repents, which the ad indicates you are doing. And they said this in the ad, that that's really all the prophet had to do was ask forgiveness of the people, repent to God, and then go on being a prophet. However, had you considered why you were led to make the mistake in the first place? Had you considered the possibility that God Almighty had something to do with it? And if that is the case, that God deliberately caused you to make a false prediction and lose face and lose trust, then it must be because he does not want people to trust you. Before you go off on your own, proclaiming you are still a prophet of Jehovah God, which they did, they said, even though we made this mistake, we are still a prophet of Jehovah. Should you not consider the possibility that you never were a prophet of Jehovah God, which would explain why God caused you to make such a foolish mistake? Perhaps your repentance should be not that you were wrong in the prophecy, but that you were wrong to ever claim the ability to make any prophecies in the first place. Now, that goes for almost all of these people. Then I went on and concluded, My friend, I write this not to condemn you, but to warn you and to remind you that God is sovereign and that you do blasphemy to the Holy One of Israel when you imply that his prophets can blunder along making wrong predictions, apologizing for them, make some more wrong predictions, apologize for them, and on and on ad infinitum. Can you realize the ridicule to which that would subject God Almighty? God Almighty does not do such things with his real prophets, and you should admit it for your own good. And then I close the letter, asking God's blessing and wisdom on him in the name of Jesus Christ. Men have predicted events all down through the ages. They do not come to pass. They say, well, I made a mistake, and then they go on and predict more. What brought this sermon on to some extent, was a week ago we had a visitor here in the congregation who gave me a detailed date, time of place of all of the events from, if I recall, the 70 weeks of Daniel right on down to the dates of the future famine, the dates of the future war, and the dates of Jesus Christ's return. And claim he got it all from the Bible. He has it printed up. They have an organization formed. And this is their major function, giving the dates, times, and places of every event for the next years right up until the return of Jesus Christ. I wrote that man a letter and told him, in effect, what I had learned from the Scripture, that I cannot really rebuke him and prove him wrong except to await out the dates and times and when the prophecy does not come to pass, and what is he? He's a false prophet, and according to God's word, he should be executed. Now, that's how serious this thing is, and yet I find this among the Christian identity people. They desire the return of Christ. They desire the end of tribulation so much that they literally grasp at straws and listen to men who give dates, times, and places of certain events, and God warns and warns and warns. There is another man who is now doing this, and we've been getting the information on it, who since 1973 has been predicting events, including earthquakes that were supposed to destroy all the city of Chicago, every man, woman, and child on July 10th, July 9th of 1979. He has now predicted that San Francisco will be almost totally destroyed in August of this year by an earthquake. Now, here's what he has done with his past predictions. And this is not new to this man. Other people have done that. He has predicted the events, date, time, and place, the destruction of a number of cities around America since 1973 by earthquake, by riots, by fire, none of which have come to pass. However, he still is continuing because he has set up what he calls a net of prayer. 
And these people, when they hear of these calamities to come, they pray. Then when the calamities do not come to pass, he sends them another letter or a tape and tells them that their prayers stop the calamity. So he becomes not only a prophet, but a savior. And I'm beginning to get letters from people on my mailing list who should know better that all that has been proven so far is not that he has saved them from calamities, but that the man's a false prophet and under the old biblical law should have been executed way back in 1973 or 74. And he's still going, making these. But our people, not knowing the word of God and not understanding how serious God takes prophecy, listen to these people and say, well, he was inexperienced, he didn't know, he didn't quite figure it out, but it's going to come, and they set a new date. Turn back to Deuteronomy 18. Let me read that again in case you didn't get the seriousness of it the first time. Deuteronomy 18, verse 20. But the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. But if thou say in thine heart, how will we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken, but the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously. Thou shalt not be afraid of him. There's an old saying that I heard years ago, and this was repeated among real estate salesmen when I was a real estate salesman to some extent, because in any kind of business transactions, you have to deal usually over a long period of time with honest people. Otherwise, you'll simply end up being a pauper because you lose money somewhere along the way, maybe lose your whole fortune if you trust people who lie to you or who trick you or who deceive you. And I learned this years ago. It's supposedly an old Indian saying, white man fool Indian once, shame on white man. White man fool Indian twice, shame on Indian. Now, you turn that around. Let me read that about the Christian, and you can memorize this very quickly. False prophet fool Christian once, shame on false prophet. False prophet fool Christian twice, shame on Christian. One time should be enough, and if he fools you again and again and again, then it's to your shame and to your foolishness and to your stupidity, not his. When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken, but the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously, thou shalt not be afraid of him. There is no place in God's word for a prophet giving a prophecy, it not coming to pass, and then that prophet coming back and saying, oh, I made a mistake, I guess I didn't hear the words too well, and I heard it this way, and it's going to be such and so, and changing it. If you can find a place in the Bible, you show it to me, and I'll read it. Now, someone will come up, of course, with the destruction of Nineveh, and they'll say, oh, but Jonah said that in 40 days Nineveh was going to be destroyed. Why was not Nineveh destroyed in 40 days? Because Nineveh repented. This man that was going around telling about California going to fall in the sea, he said California didn't fall in the sea because people in California and people back in Iowa and here in Arizona prayed that California wouldn't fall into the sea. Now, if God actually prophesied that California was going to fall into the sea at a certain date, the only biblical reason it would not happen is if California repented of their sins and then God lifted the calamity. It is repentance that changes calamities, not prayer. Now, some people have the mistaken idea that they can pray and stop God's hand in certain things where there is no repentance. It is not possible according to the scripture. False prophet, let me read that again. False prophet fool Christian once, shame on false prophet. False prophet fool Christian twice, shame on Christian. All right, let's close in Jeremiah 23. This is about ministers. It begins, Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pastors, saith the Lord. Let's read verse 23. 
Am I a God at hand, saith the Lord, and not a God afar off? Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, saith the Lord? Do not I fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord? In other words, God knows all these things that are going on. I have heard what the prophets said that prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed, or I have seen a vision. And that's the main thing. They say, oh, I saw a vision. God gave me a vision, or an angel spoke to me, or whatever. This man who's uh, prophesying these calamities that are supposed to destroy certain cities by earthquakes, the um, ones that he's been getting, he claims that he speaks to the angel Gabriel, and in some cases it is Jesus Christ personally who has come down to earth, talked to him, given the dates, times, and places of the city that was supposed to be destroyed. God says, I have heard what the prophet said, so God hears these things, that prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed, or I've seen a vision. How long shall this be in the heart of the prophets that prophesy lies? Yea, they are prophets of the deceit of their own heart, which think to cause my people to forget my name by their dreams or visions, which they tell every man to his neighbor, as their fathers have forgotten my name for Baal. The prophet that hath a dream, let him tell a dream. And he that hath my word... Let him speak my word faithfully. What is the chaff to the wheat, saith the Lord? The dream, the vision, whatever this man claims he has, is what? It's chaff. It'll fly away in the wind. And it's already done that all down through 2,000 years. These men have been coming, and I guess before that, according to the Old Testament, telling people that God said such and so was going to take place, and people turn around and they order their lives, they change their family plans, they even sell their homes, they quit jobs, they move, their whatever. For what? They're following chaff. God says, what is the chaff to the wheat? God's word is wheat. Chaff will have no harvest. God's word planted will produce a harvest. He that hath my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What is the chaff to the wheat, saith the Lord? Is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces? Therefore, behold, I am against the prophet, saith the Lord, that steal my words, every one from his neighbor. Now, you may not have thought of that prophet predicting these future events as being a thief who steals God's word. But you think about people you know who follow these men who claim to have visions and dreams and prophets, and what do they desire? What do they spend their time getting after that? Visions and dreams and prophecies. Do they spend their time studying God's Word and finding God's Word? No, they have lost the desire for God's Word. God's Word has been stolen from them by this false prophet. God says, I'm against those prophets, saith the Lord, that steal my words. And that's what these men do who do these things, every one from his neighbor. Behold, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that use their tongues and say, he saith, or God saith. Behold, I am against them that prophesy false dreams, saith the Lord, and do tell them, and cause my people to err by their lies and by their lightness or faultness, falseness. Yet I sent them not, nor commanded them, therefore they shall not profit, P-R-O-F-I-T. They shall not profit this people at all, saith the Lord. Now, God didn't say they wouldn't profit, P-R-O-F-I-T, themselves. I know the one man, I met him several times, who was traveling in California in the southwest area back in the mid-60s on through the early 1970s. He claimed to have seen a vision of California falling into the sea. Now, I don't know whether he's still doing this, but at least for possibly from 1965 to 1975, the man traveled with his wife and with his family in a uh, huge pickup truck with a big camper on the back pulling a trailer. And they went from home to home to church to church all over the Southwest. Doing what? Getting their livelihood on that vision that he saw. He didn't preach God's word. He didn't preach personal living. 
He did not preach the truths of God's word. All he preached was that vision, and he made P-R-O-F-I-T his livelihood. Everything he made from that one thing, and he didn't work. And that's what the rest of these fellows do. They make a living off of people with these false prophecies. And God says, of the people, not of the false prophet. Therefore, they shall not profit this people at all. There is absolutely no good or advantage or blessing that will come to you from a man who prophesies false events or predicts things in the future that do not come to pass. Now, of all the people in Christendom who should not fall for this kind of thing, it is you people who know the great and marvelous outworking of God's kingdom prophecies of the things that he has done in the past for the people, the ones who know the truth that we are to love our neighbor as ourselves and desire the kingdom for them, not knowledge of some event in August or October or 1984 or whatever that might benefit or bring something to us. God says it will bring no profit to his people to listen to these kind of men. Now, that should not exist. That kind of thing should not exist in the Israel Identity Movement. However, I'm sad to say that it does. Some of our people just turn away and they give up the word because the word gets stolen from them by following those kind of preachers and prophets. And let's pray that God will bless us with wisdom to just bide our time. And when the man says that something's going to take place on October 9th of such and such a day, as soon as the day comes and passes and it doesn't happen as far as you're concerned, he's a false prophet. You are to pay him no honor, respect have nothing to do with him. Let's stay in the word and with God's true prophets who have already been proven by their prophecies coming to pass in ages past right on down to the present day. Our Father and our God, we thank you for your word that gives us this warning. We just pray for our dear people, Lord God, that they'll keep their eyes upon you and upon your word, upon this marvelous future that is coming not, be just, not just because you have said it was come, but because your word has been fulfilled, every jot and tittle all down through the ages. Thou art a true prophet, and you've given your word to our people in ages past. You've proven yourself time and time again, so we should turn away from these frail children of the dust who claim this ability to foretell the future and even claim that you have given it to them. Father, we pray that you'll...